I usually don't bring water with me to the pulpit, but if you understand, hope you understand my voice is, uh, is going this morning. I had to <clears throat> bring a little bit of water so I didn't have to run back and forth. I meant to mention that uh, in my opening remarks this morning, that as I was going through that first lesson with my wife, <clears throat> I've been preaching a long time. I've never heard, I've never seen or had heard anybody do this, but she suggested, she says, Jerry, when you, when you get up there, right before you get behind that podium, why don't you run back to the bathroom? Take about five minutes and come back up. Apologize for having to go to the restroom and get into your sermon. I just thought that was kind of, kind of odd, but I, I think I got her point. Finally, is that uh, in showing reverence to God, we need you know we need to be a people that truly come to worship God. And I know there's times when we have to go to the restroom, but there's uh, but but I believe there's times when we should limit that uh, in getting getting up and down. I'll tell you a pet peeve that I have is that, especially during the invitation song, I don't know how any other preachers feel about, feel about this, but I have a difficult time in saying, my brethren, when, I've just, when, when the Lord has just given his invitation and says, come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And the preacher's inviting people to come to the front, to either be immersed, of their, uh, to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of their sins and add it to the New Testament church, or to make correction, repent of something in their life that they've done, confess something to their brothers and sisters that were so disrespectful that were running back and forth to the bathroom yeah. during perhaps causing someone to have second thoughts. Second thoughts, and maybe they're saying, well, if, that's not, if this isn't so important to them that they're running back and forth, then it isn't important that I go up, up front and, and confess my faults or become a New Testament Christian. I think that's something we just need uh, to look at, something that we need to be aware of. Sometimes we don't even know that we do those things. And I know people who, I, I see it time after time, week after week after week. Some people just save going to the bathroom for the time when we should all be participating and praying that somebody's going to come forward to become a New Testament Christian. And yet we're so disrespectful and we're irreverent uh, in that area of our worship. I think that it needs to be given some uh, consideration. I gave the church at Holbert a challenge at the beginning of the year, just a, vi a very fif easy 15-minute uh, challenge. And, and I told them, if you'll involve yourself in this, I would guarantee, I would guarantee that at the end of the year, you would come to me and thank me for sharing this with you because it will strengthen you, it will encourage you, it will help you in your walk as a Christian to be the kind of Christian that God wants and needs you to be. <laughs> And the challenge was simply to take out your Bible every day. To take out your Bible, find a passage, just open it up and, and read a passage, or find a passage that you have a difficult time with. Read that passage. Meditate. Take five minutes and do that. Read that passage, and then take five minutes and meditate upon what you just read. Meditate upon it. Give it some thought. Think of the application that it had during that time, and think of the application that it has for you in your life today. And then spend five minutes in prayer to God. Fifteen minutes a day. Meditating or reading the Bible, meditating. And in that area of your life, praying to God. Pray that he might open some doors for you, that you might have a better understanding of his word. I guarantee you, friends, if you will do that, 15 minutes a day or more, if you like. I'm just asking for 15 minutes. I guarantee you it will enrich your life. It might even cause you to be or have more daily reverence in your life that you need to have, that maybe you don't have because this whole world is so busy around us. It's, it's got its hands around us. It's dragging us away from the things that we know we've got to do, from the things that we must do. I mean, how many times outside of Thursday, Friday, and today, how many times this last week did you open your Bible and read it? Take out Wednesday night. Take out Wednesday too, I guess, because you'd study it here. But in a normal week, let's say, how much do you take out your Bible and study it? You study it at all? Do you have any reverence for God throughout the week that you would take out his word and study his word? That you would meditate upon it? That you would pray to God to open doors, give you doors of opportunity to help you understand the word a little bit better? Friends, I believe there are all kind of different ways in our daily lives that we can reverence God. I'm not going to stand up here this morning and enumerate all of those, though there are too many of them. But I think you can see that there's a great need for that. 
I don't know what the percentage here that, that, would, that would apply to. How many people don't take their Bible out and, and study it during the week? What a shame that is. I mean, I heard a preacher say a long time ago, and I've never forgot it. I might say it differently, but I'll never forget what he, what he wanted, the point was that he was trying to make. And that is, this is the will of God. This is God's mind. How much do we try to understand God's mind on our own? Making sure that what the preacher has said or the Bible class teacher has taught is the truth. How much do we spend time in doing that? Have we become people of the book or have we become people of the forgotten book? Hosea says, my people will be destroyed for a lack of knowledge. How knowledgeable have we become in God's word? And I know there are, there, are, there are folks here this morning who are very knowledgeable. Perhaps read your Bible through many times. That's, that's great. I commend that. I only wish others could learn from you in their daily walk as a Christian and involve themselves in, in doing the very same thing. To realize that my purpose on this earth is not to go out and go bass fishing, although that's fun. It's not to go out and play golf. That's fun. That's great. Don't get me wrong. Those things are good to bake cakes and be involved with my kids and all kinds of activities. That's not my purpose here on earth. My purpose on earth is to serve God. And in serving God, he allows me to do all these other things, to enjoy all these other blessings. I just became a grandfather on December the 22nd. Now, I know I'm too young. I look like I'm 19 to be a grandfather, but it did happen. Uh, my, my daughter and her husband been married, I can't even tell you, six, five years, six years. Uh, had our first grandchild. I am just elated. It's everything I want to do. They live in uh, at Camp Lejeune, Jacksonville, North Carolina. He's in the uh, United States Marine Corps. I was permitted to see her uh, just uh, after the new year. I was able to go there, and then they were here just this last week. And uh, when all that snow happened, uh, she got snowed in an extra day. Uh, she made a comment that uh, her mother and I must have pulled some strings <laughs> to keep them here another day. It's everything I want to do to go to hold that baby. It's everything I want to do to go and be with that child. I want to see it grow. I want to see it grow up. This morning as I was walking out the door, she Googled plus me. And for those of you, I don't know all there is to know about that kind of thing. It's kind of like Skype. I hit the button and there's my granddaughter. Good luck today, Grandpa. It's my daughter speaking, but my granddaughter's face. Can't tell you how that made me feel. How much more does the God of heaven expect that of his children? Wanting and desiring and giving us, giving us today something that they didn't have during the first century church. Giving us his word that we could take it out and study it and come to know his mind. I want to talk to you a little I think when we're done, you'll understand my angle for approaching uh, this lesson today. As we think about daily reverence, I do want you to think about those kinds of things. But I believe, but I believe if we have our worship in order, if we have our house in order, that the way that we live during our Monday through Saturday life will reflect the way that we worship when we come into God's house on his day, a special day, the Lord's day. Now, we could talk about how we, how we, how we uh, uh, don't show reverence uh, in our daily lives by the way we treat our brethren, you know, the arguing and the bickering, the way we treat our wives or our husbands, the way we treat our kids and those kinds of things, by the way we treat the gas station attendant or the mailman or you know, somebody gave us the wrong change in line or uh, somebody's got 25 items in the grocery line when they're only supposed to have 15 and we just go ballistic. Or one of my pet peeves is when somebody doesn't use their turn signal. I just go ballistic. I can't believe people don't use their turn signal. Does that even matter? My wife says, Jerry, does it matter? Does it matter if somebody didn't use their turn signal? Well, yeah, it does. It could cause an accident. No, Jerry, in the bigger scheme of things, does it really matter? And it doesn't. What does matter? What matters in the big scheme of things is that I remember the purpose that I'm on this earth. And that is, I'm here to serve God. And I serve him, I serve him through worship. And worship is the response of all that man is, that, that God is and does. Let me say that again. Worship is the response of all that man is to all that God is and does. We wouldn't deny that. 
what God does for us. We should, we should worship him as we've already noted and be thankful for the things that he's given us, the very blessing of, of the breath in our lungs to be able to live and move and have our very being. Do we thank him for those kinds of things? He does so many wonderful things for us. But so many, especially those of us who are Christians, don't worship him. Don't give him the thanks. Don't give him the honor for those things in our lives. We don't, we don't worship today, as we've mentioned, for what we can get out of it. But we worship today because God is worthy of worship, as I've already said. And if we learn to worship God in spirit and in truth, and we learn to put God first in our lives, and then my daily reverence for God or my daily walk with God is going to be different than those of the world. You know, I, I, can, only think of, uh, of, uh, I can think of many examples, but one that really stands out in my mind is Job. When Job was going through everything that, that he was going through, remember he lost everything that he had, and he looks around. He looks around, and he sees his neighbors who aren't uh, who, who who aren't after God, who 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 don't struggle like Job does. They're of the world, but they're prospering. They're prospering. And Job asked the question, "What have I done? What have I done? Why why are my neighbors? Why are they uh, able to prosper here? I've lost everything, and I and I've lived my life for you, God." And I think God responds in the way, and he says, he says, Job, don't worry about it. There, there, there's a day coming when I'll even the score. When I'll make all things right. And so in my, daily, in my daily walk, it might be a burden. I might feel that it's a burden, although I, I don't believe I should, to take out my Bible and to study it, because I want to be different than those of the world. Because God's going to even the score one of these days. He's only going to call a few people home. That road is narrow, he says. It's a narrow road that leads to eternal life. Have you ever thought about that? Are you on that narrow road? But broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many are on that road. I choose to be on the narrow road. I pray I'm on that narrow road. And so I want to be, I want to be a light into a community, don't you? A beacon of, of light, a beacon of hope. That that now, they don't have to worry about old Jerry, you know, doing things that are wrong or running around on his wife, or going out and drinking and smoking and doing all these kinds of things, not putting God first in his life. You don't have to worry about that. Because I want to be different from the world. I want the world to know that I serve a risen Savior, that he's alive, that he's not dead, that he is alive, and I serve him because he is God, and I serve him because of what he has, he has done for me. And I worship him because of not what I can get out of it, but... I realize what he gets out of it. He gets a smile on his face, perhaps. And he accepts our worship. He accepts our worship. So many things, aren't there, in regards to our worship that perhaps we haven't thought about. It's been three, three lessons. Well, there's been, what, six lessons now that have been presented. And, and perhaps, as I said in the first lesson, we need to teach on it even more because it's such an important area. Because we become to think like the world. And let me go to church and just give God his hour. Let me go and give him just an, the hour or the two. Because that's all I'm going to give him. I don't think God is pleased with that. True worship, for those of you who worship God, and, 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 and maybe when you sing that song you have a tear in your eye, or maybe that Bible verse brought a tear to your eye, or... Or well, that thing that the preacher said brought a tear to your eye. I think that when we look at true worship, that all of us would, would, would really agree that it leads to personal enrichment in our lives. And it leads to enablement. It helps me to help others. and helps you in return to help others. It gives us that kind of hope. It gives us that kind of strength. That we as Christians can go out into the world or we as Christians, even in the church, can bear one another's burdens and help each other and fight these battles of life as they come. The death of a loved one, the bad report of someone who's gotten cancer. I received a report just this last week. My mom's brother's wife, my aunt, has stage four lung cancer, inoperable. It has spread to the point where they can't operate. You talk about a blow to our family. 
Her children are taking it very difficult. She's not a Christian. She's not a Christian. But my dependence upon God, the reverence that I have for God, I understand that through dark times, through struggles, through temptations, that God is with me, that God will help me to fight those battles. And if I'm faced, and if I'm in that doctor's office, and I'm face to face with that doctor, and he says to me, Jerry, you have cancer. Or you have some other disease, or some other sickness, or illness. That God is with me, that he help me fight that. And that I can overcome. And I can be victorious. Because I've rested in the promises that he makes to his children, that he promises never to leave us, never to forsake us, to always be with us and to see us through. In our study this weekend, true worship has been defined, hasn't it? I believe that it has. It's been described. And in some cases, we've even shown what false worship is in service to our God. I would like to now begin... Uh, to discover what true worship is by noticing three of the characteristics found again in John chapter 4, verses 20 through 24. Turn over there again with me, if you would. We, we use this for a text uh, in our lesson this morning. I'd like to use it uh, again this evening, or this, uh, again this morning. Uh, but in John chapter 4, beginning in verse 20, down through verse 24, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem shall you worship the Father. Verse 22, You worship that which you do not know. We worship that which we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is a spirit, and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now again, we see from this passage three things, I believe. Well, there's more than three things, but three things that I want to bring out uh, this morning. Uh, that the right object of our worship is God, as we've already noted. The right attitude is that we worship him in spirit. And the right standard, again, is that we worship him uh, in, in truth. True worship must be devoted to the right object. If we're not devoting our energies, our worship towards the right being, then our worship is not worship. If all the things that we've talked about this morning are devoted to something else or someone else other than God, it's not worship. Our worship must be, has to be directed, devoted to the right object. And as we've already noted, and I'll emphasize again, the Bible, I think, brilliantly teaches, don't you? Teaches us that God is to be the sole object of our worship. And so I don't have to come into the church building, the church house, and worry about worshiping anything other than God. Worshiping idols or worshiping the Pope. I don't have to worry about worshiping anything other than God. How do I know that? Well, as we already noted in Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 5, God wanted to be the object of their worship. He required that they remembered him or remember what he did for them and give him their worship. In Matthew chapter uh, 4, verses 8 through 10. Go ahead and turn over there if you would. Matthew chapter, I don't have a slide. Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 8, 8 through 10. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him into the holy city, and he had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will give his angels charge concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, On the other hand it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things will I give you if you fall down and worship me. 
Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Now since God is to be the, the only object that we worship today, it follows then, as we've mentioned, that we're not to worship anything else. We're not to worship the devil. Now you could go on the internet and look up devil worship and you'll be surprised as to how many pages have been devoted to just that thing. Devil worship. People worshiping the devil. Do you believe that? I mean, our young people in our schools, you probably see that today. I saw it when I was in school. People who worship sat satanic things, satanic items. They go out in the woods and they do some very dumb things, as far as I'm concerned. Because we're not to worship the devil. We're to worship God. We're not to worship angels. We're not to worship anything other than God. And when I say anything, that includes everything. I think sometimes some of my brethren worship the riches of the world. Because of all that we try to accomplish in this world. Again, there's nothing wrong with having money. Don't get, don't get me wrong. It's how we use it. It's, what we, it's if we put it in place of God. If that becomes our God. And, and, we, and, we, and we miss the services because we're working. And maybe we're working overtime and we're not worshiping with the saints on the Lord's Day. I think God's pleased with that. I mean, he, he tells us not to love the things of this world. Why? Because we're going to leave all these things behind one of these days. It goes back to what I said earlier. We're here to serve God and worship God because it's him we can and will be with eternally. And nobody can take that away from us. Now the devil tries. The devil tries. The riches of this world try. But for the true Christian, he's come to know and come to learn that in his daily reverence, that he's going to seek God first, not the things of this earth, not the things of this world, that we're going to put our hope and trust in God. And also, as we talked about, remember, God is the audience. God is the audience of our worship today. And I think as we think about this idea of worship, whether it's in church or on our own individually, that we realize that God is holy, that he's holy. He's something special because he is God. And thus we approach him with that kind of attitude, with that type of attitude that again says, I'm, I'm fearing you because you are God, not because of who you are, but what you can do to me. You can kill my body and you can kill my soul. And we could also read in Isaiah chapter 6, uh, verses 1 through 8, that God is the object, again, of our true uh, worship. And also, I want to go over to the book of Hebrews. I don't have time to read all of these uh, this morning, so uh, thanks for your patience in that regard. But go to Hebrews chapter 12. I want to read verses 28 uh, through 29. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses, uh, verse 28, he says, Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. I don't know if you've thought about that very much. I mean, we often think about God as being God and a merciful God and a loving God and sending his son into the world. Yes, he did all those, all those things. He created everything that we know, everything that we see, and everything that we ever will know and everything that we ever will see. But he's also a consuming fire. But Peter also tells me that God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. A loving God, a consuming fire. Is God pleased with, with our worship? Is God happy with the way that I'm living my life on a daily basis in reverence and honor to him? Because, friends, if he's not, if he's not accepting that, if we're saying we're one thing and living our lives as another, they call that, what, a hypocrite? If we're living in a hypocritical way, God's not pleased with that. You know, it's easy to come into the church and, and fool your brothers and sisters, but you can't fool God. God knows how much you study. God knows where your heart is. God knows your attitude. And so you might come here and fool you know, people, but you can't fool God. And remember, it's before God who you're going to stand. 
and give account for the way that you've lived. Consider what happened when men encountered the holiness of God. Before I get to that, I just want to ask you the, uh, the, the question that pertains to, to that. Have you ever encountered the holiness of God yourself? Have you ever encountered God's holiness in your worship? Does it mean that much to you that you would be that respectful of God and see him as the holy being that he truly is? Well, Abraham, in Genesis chapter 18 and verse 27, when he encountered God, what did he say? He confessed that he was just dust and ashes. He understood the holiness of God. Job said in chapter 42 and verse 6, I, have, I abhor myself and I repent in dust and ashes. I'm going to change my life. I realize who God is. I'm sick of myself. I can't get through this life on my own. I need God's help. In Habakkuk, in Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 16, trembled in the presence of God. Now I set the stage this morning and I said that God is in our midst when there's two or three more gathered in his name. When is the last time we trembled because of that? In our worship and how about in our daily lives? When's the last time, when's the last time that we trembled at the presence of God? I can go outside and I can look up into the sky and I and I believe my faith that God, is, that God is there. I look at everything around me and I see that God put those things for man to enjoy on this earth. But when is the last time I truly trembled? That I truly trembled? I fell on my knees as it were. And I trembled in the presence of God. Oh, that we trembled more, huh? Oh, that we trembled more. Oh, that we realized God is truly holy. In Ezra chapter 9 and verse 6, how many times have we said this? Oh, my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head, and our guiltiness is grown up unto the heavens. A true worshiper will not approach God and worship in a flippant manner, and we won't approach God in our, in our personal lives in a flippant manner uh, as well. We ought not to be passing in and out of, the, of our worship. And, and again, I think as we learn these things, that it helps us in our, in, our, in our personal life, in our daily reverence, because I think that you know, we've lost a respect for God in our daily lives today, because I think we believe that the only time we need to worship God is when we come into his presence. And thus we live our lives any way that we want, grabbing all the life that we can. Many times Christians forget about God. But in our worship, we shouldn't be going in and out, passing notes, whispering, you know, like we're at a ball game. It's a time, friend, of reverence. I mentioned a funeral earlier. I, I, I have preached quite a few funerals. I said I don't like them, and I don't. But I got to tell you, it's, it's one of the most reverent places that I can go. Because I don't see people getting up and down. I don't see people passing notes. I see people being respectful, paying their respects for the one who's laid out in front of them. Doesn't matter if it's a half an hour lesson, 40 minute lesson, I, I, I'd be willing to say in all the funerals I preach, I have yet to see somebody get out of, a, out of a seat and go to the bathroom. Why is that? Place and time. We understand that's a place of respect. How much more than when we come into God's house and his presence and realize what it says on the front of that table, this do in remembrance of me, that Christ gave his life for us, that we need to be reverent and that we need to be respectful, not passing notes. And, you know, sometimes I'll be up preaching, I hear somebody go, 
Makes me tired. <laughs> you ever heard someone do that? <sighs> Just as irreverent as anything. Here, I'm pouring my heart and soul into it. Bill, you know what I'm talking about. Pouring your heart and soul into it, somebody's bored. Somebody's not excited. Somebody's not enthused. A true worshiper will not approach God and worship in a flippant manner. And we won't do it outside the church either. We won't do it outside the church either. Many have more respect, as I said, at a funeral than they do in the presence of the living God. And friends, that's, that's sad. It's something we need to give heed to. Because God is holy, we will approach him with gratitude, with thanksgiving in our hearts for everything that he's done for us, for all the blessings that we enjoy in life. Do you do that? Do you do that in your daily life? Do you, do you wake up giving God thanks for the sunshine or the cloudy day or the rain or the snow? For the blessings that you're going to enjoy today? And Lord, if I get too haughty with these blessings, take them away from me. Help me to share my blessings with others. Open doors for me today, Lord. We thank God for the things that we have. He doesn't give us things that we deserve. Because if he gave us what we deserve, we'd all be dead. We'd all be dead. Because God is holy. He gives us opportunity to share in his great mercy. A worshiping soul is a grateful and penitent soul. When's the last time you repented over something, friend? Why is it that we don't see that more in churches of Christ today? People walking down the aisles and confessing their faults to brethren who say they love each other. Or in your daily life, calling up somebody on the phone and saying, Hey, Ma, you know, I need to talk to you about an issue that I have in my life. Can you, can you give me some help? I'm a little embarrassed. I don't, I don't really want this to get out, but can, can you give me some advice here? Can you give me a way to go? Why don't we do that more in the church today? Why don't people confess their faults? Why aren't these pews full of people? including me, when I really need to confess my faults. Because I understand as a New Testament Christian that sin will not enter those pearly gates, those pearly streets, those gates of gold. Why is it? Why is it that we don't thank God in gratitude and, and ask him to forgive us of the sin that we have in our lives? I think it's because we've become so much like the world. Or uh, I really think that the real answer is that you know we're 2,000 years removed from the cross. We weren't there when any of this stuff happened. We didn't see any of this stuff. We didn't. None of it. None of it in here any of us saw. We're 2,000 years removed from this. Why should we believe in this? Well, simple answer is because of faith. Christian life is built strictly on faith, on a confidence that that is the true, inerrant word of God. That God says, God delivers, and I understand that I approach him and give him thanks because of the things that he allows me to have in this life. And what he allowed me to have most of all was his son who died so that I might have eternal life. True worship must be accompanied in spirit. Worshiping in spirit means with the life of the worshiper. The, the, the attitude of the true worshiper, of course, begins, uh, begins long before he gets to the worship assembly. And I've got to tell you, friends, I, I've seen people just show up and not be ready to worship God at all. I've seen people show up for Bible studies and not have their lesson done. We're going through a, uh, I think, uh, a study that y'all have gone through here at Hobart, and it's called uh, the three-cycle approach or four-cycle approach, whatever you want to call it. And I put together a little quiz, and I asked the people to uh, put your name at the, at the top of the paper and pass them to the center aisle, and I was going to collect them. I gave them a week to do the quiz. Put your name on it, pass it to the center aisle, and I'm going to collect them. I didn't tell them what I was going to do with them. But you'd have thought, I don't know what you would have thought. I don't know who had them done. I don't know how many had not done them. But I can tell you, friends, there were some, probably a great majority, that didn't have it done. 
20 questions, 20 easy questions, all week long to answer 20 questions. And when I asked them to pass them to the middle, you thought I shot their mother or something. Oh, you! Okay, I'll tell you what. I'll give you another week. Take another. I'm going to collect them tomorrow. We'll see, we'll see the expression I get tomorrow. But what are we doing in our daily lives? Are we truly people of the book? Are we truly Christians? Are we truly Christ-like? Worshiping in spirit begins with the life of of the worshiper. I need to have my life in order. I need to have a close, intimate relationship with life. Remember when you all were dating, or those who are dating now, you know what it's like to have an intimate and close relationship with the one you love. <laughs> I remember those days like they were yesterday. I've known my wife since she was eight years old. Been married 32, 33 years. So add eight on top of that, it's a, long, uh, it's a long time that we've known each other, almost all my life. But I can remember those days of having that funny feeling in my stomach, those butterflies in my stomach. When's the last time you had butterflies in your stomach when you come through those doors? Knowing that you're about to worship the God of heaven. Knowing that you're about to worship the God before whom you will stand one of these days. Doesn't that cause you to live your life differently? To have a daily reverence for him? See, I think we've lost that. I think we've lost those butterflies in our, in our lives today. Again, because of the fleeting changes of life and the, and the riches of this world, we need to have uh, an attitude, a, a loving attitude of, of fellowship, of the right relationship with God when we come into his house. But our conduct and attitudes relate to our worship. If you're having a bad day and you come into the worship assembly, more than likely everyone's going to know that you're having a bad day. Especially if you talk to others, they're going to know you're having a bad day. And, and, and maybe sometimes that's, that's, that's good because we, can, we have people there that can help us and comfort us and get us through some of those tough times in our lives. But that's not what I'm talking about there. I'm talking about having the right attitude, having those butterflies when we come into the worship of God. A life of disobedience makes our worship unacceptable. For example, you can go over to the book of Isaiah, chapter 1, verses 11 through 15, and you can understand there that the problem with their worship is that God didn't accept their worship. And then you can read Isaiah, chapter 1, verses 16 through 18, and see that a little bit further. That again, as we said in our earlier lesson, that God is not pleased with people's worship. He wasn't then, and today he isn't as well. So if I know that there's a chance or an opportunity that God's not pleased with me, I need to make some changes. I need to do something different. I need to make some wholesale changes in my life. In Amos chapter 5, verses 21 through 23, again, we can see there that they weren't worshiping God in the right, in the right way. They weren't not righteous, and they had left off judgment there in verse 24. And that's a dangerous thing. And I think when we go out into our personal walks of life, we can, we can see that in many different areas of our life where we're not the righteous type of people that God intends for us to be, that we're not a light into the community, that we're not a rock that those who are lost can anchor to, that we're not the salt of the earth, but that we become different. We become something more or less than what God intends for us to be. He wasn't happy with it then. And he isn't happy with it today as well. Private devotion and prayer. Those are the things that we need to involve ourselves in today. We need to involve ourselves more in prayer. How often do you pray, brethren? How often do you go to God in prayer? In your private life, outside of church, do you pray to God? You know, I've heard it said many times that sometimes when you come into God's house and you hear the brethren pray, you, you wonder how, many, how much do they pray in their home life? How much time do you spend with God in prayer? You know, my wife will often tell me, and, I, and the older I get, the more I realize that this is true. Sometimes you just fall asleep when you pray to God. 
And I don't know if God is happy with that or not. I'm not trying to pass judgment, but I know that that, that, that happens. You, you, you lay it all on the line. You spend time with God in prayer. You pray to him daily. How much time do you spend, Jerry, in prayer? As much as you want. I heard Bill Boswell say a long time ago, Dean, you probably remember this. I think you were at Portage at the time he was given this lesson. He said, you can go to God in prayer at any time. God's, God never has a busy signal. 24-7. Do we take advantage of the avenue of prayer? When my dad was dying, he, I asked dad, dad, how are you making it through this? How are you dealing with the pain and this, all these blood treatments and everything? He said, Jerry, the only way I make it is I know people are praying for me. People are praying for me. I know he was praying for himself, but what he meant is that there were so many people putting his name in the very lap of God, as it were, offering prayer on his behalf. Do we pray to God as we should, as we must? Private devotion, prayer, and moments of meditation. Put all that together with living a godly life, a, a, a good life, a righteous life, prepares us then for a rich and meaningful worship in the assembly of the saints. I suggest we need to be better prepared when we come to God's house. Have your lessons done. What else do we do throughout the week? It's like going to school. You wouldn't send your kid to school when they give them a math quiz and not have the math quiz done and send them to school. You wouldn't do that. You'd make them stay up to midnight if you had to until they got the quiz done. Why is church different? Why is worshiping God any different? It shouldn't be. As a matter of fact, he should be doing his church work before his school work. But there's an uneven balance there in our lives because, again, we, we, we become like the world and thinking that it's okay. We'll give God the seconds. And I can't help but go back to what Brother Mark used as one of his texts last night in the Malachi, the whole book of Malachi. But again, they were offering blemished animals to God. They were given uh, things that God wouldn't accept. And remember what God said, why do you offer this stuff to me? You wouldn't give it to your governor. You wouldn't give this stuff to a person that's important. Why are you giving it to me? Don't you see me as important? No, I want your best. I want you to put me first in your life. After all, God's the one that can help us. He's the one that promises us to promises to sustain us and to give us the things that we need, but we put more, more trust in, in things and riches of the world rather than in believing in the promises, I think, uh, of God. And I think that is a danger uh, in a Christian's life today. The spirit of the worshiper, uh, I think this has reference again to attitude, what we think about and how we feel as we go through our worship, the kinds of things that we're thinking about, what do we think about on a daily basis, a basis uh, in our lives. True worship involves more than just you know those things that are right uh, on the outside of our lives. We are to offer up spiritual sacrifices as we see in 1 Peter chapter 2. We are to draw nigh unto God with a true heart as Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 22 tells us. Uh, and then you could also note there Psalms 103 and Matthew chapter 15 uh, verses 7 through 9. But I just want to point out again that in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 9, we have to have the right kind of heart. And he says there, sing and make melody in your hearts to the Lord. I believe it all starts with the heart, in worship and out of worship. What do I expect to get out of things in this life? It's a matter of what I put into, into life. If I'm going to be a negative person and always looking at the negative things, then that's where I'm going to get back. But if I'm a positive person and I have a better outlook, on life, I'm going to get. I'm going to feel that way, and I think those. I'll be rewarded that way, and I think also that applies to the church as well. In Colossians, <clears throat> chapter three and verse sixteen, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And so I don't think there's anyone here that would deny the fact that whether we're in the assembly of the saints or we're out in out in our homes, that being reverent to God begins in our hearts. But someone might be asking there, as you see on the page, how can we prepare in heart so as to be prepared to worship in spirit? How can we prepare so that we'll not be bored and indifferent? How can we be prepared so that we'll not have cold and calloused hearts? 
How can we be prepared so that we'll not be hurried in a rush to get it over with and out of there? How do we prepare for that? How do we prepare to keep ourselves attentive, to keep ourselves focused and not have our minds wandering, you know, about what's for lunch or what's in the oven or, or, or this or that or other activities, but to keep our minds focused on the activities uh, and, and, and to give God what he is due, to give him the worth to give him the honor in all areas, all aspects of our lives. I think these are some principles uh, that will help. Develop spiritual mindedness as opposed to having a mind focused on fleshly things. Focus on those things that are spiritual. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, we're reminded of that truth. In Psalms 119 verse 97, the psalm writer said, Oh how... Love, oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Can we even come close to that saying? That verse? Saying that we love the law and that we meditate upon it? How much? Five minutes a day? 20 minutes a day? To become people of the book? Maintain a worship, worshipful atmosphere? Always, in Psalms 89 and verse 7, God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be held in reverence by all those around him. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 20, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. And friends, I would suggest that we need to keep our attention focused and centered upon God. Not on the building, Building doesn't, it's going to burn up one of these. It'll be gone one of these days. Not, don't, don't, you know, not, on somebody's, not on somebody's clothes. And I haven't talked about that too much this morning. Uh, uh, about the way that we dress. I, I, I think that uh, we need to have a reverent respect when we come into God's house. And that will show uh, in, the way that, in the way that we dress. And does that mean suit and tie? Uh, I think we need to give our best to God. I, I think whatever that we have is our best. We need to give that to God. Again, I talked about a funeral. You know, I go to a funeral. For the most part, men and women are dressed in suits and ties and dresses. And that's at a funeral home. Why wouldn't we pay the same kind of respect when we come into God's house? And to give God our best. Something we should think about. Because I believe we should give God our best, don't you? Again, look at Malachi. They were giving him lambs that were blemished. I, I liken that to blue jeans with holes in them. Kids coming into the assembly today with blue jeans and holes in them and flip-flops. I wonder how the Lord would react if he were here. He is here. Is that being respectful? Is that being respectful? I, I, I don't think that it is. By the, way that, by the way that we dress, we call our attention to God by being reverent people, by wearing our Sunday Showing reverence to God. Now, I believe, I believe sometimes that uh, brethren have the wrong idea that God is just going to accept whatever it is that we throw in his lap. And I don't think that's the truth. Our best. What is your best? Whether it's your clothes, whether it's your service, whether it's your respect, are you giving it to God? Are you truly giving it to God? Because that is what he demands. You might give it to your governor... And I liken that to President Obama. And I, it, it doesn't matter which party you, you are a member of today, Democrat, Republican. If President Obama were to come here or outside, I, 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 I would hasten to say that for the most part, everyone would be dressed to the, to the nines. You would be dressed as, as best you could. Or if you had a chance to go and visit him at the White House, you wouldn't wear a pair of shorts and flip-flops. I see people coming to church in shorts and flip-flops. And I don't think that's giving God the respect that he is due. Is that the best we can do? The, the people of Malachi's day thought it was. God says that's not your best. You have animals out there that don't have any spot, no blemish. Give me that. That's what I want. Give that other stuff to somebody else. And I think when we think in terms of our assembly today, we've got to realize God wants our best. 
What if I came today and I had a pair of flip-flops and a pair of shorts and a muscle man t-shirt on? What would you think? Would you allow me to preach? Probably never invite me back. Probably never invite me back. And so if it's true of your speaker, why isn't it true of everyone else? Our, I'm talking about our best. What is your best? What is the best that you have to offer to God? Are you giving him that? Are you putting your attention, your focus on God? And realizing again, folks, that when we come into God's house, he is our object of worship. He is here. And he is deserving. He's deserving of our best. In Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. God knows everything. He's all saying he's omnipotent, omnipresent. He's everywhere. He knows, he knows everything. So let's not think that we can uh, get away from God. God knows everything. And then I think another principle that helps is that we pray for a united, uh, we, we pray for a united heart. Uh, we see that in Psalms 86, verses 5 through 11. In verse 11, he says, Unite my heart to fear thy name. The idea is unite my heart in worship. And I think we need to do that more in the church today, to unite our hearts, to be together in our worship to the Lord, so that we'll not be bored and indifferent, so that we'll not have cold and honest hearts, so that we will truly give God our all, and to center our attention upon God. Pray for a united heart. And then lastly, the worship must be according to truth. Worship has always been a matter of divine stipulation. It's what God has asked for in church and out of church, showing daily reverence for him. It was shown under the patriarchal age. Uh, for example, go back to Genesis chapter 4. Notice there the worship that was required of, of Cain and Abel. It was required under the law of Moses in Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 through 2. You remember there in Leviticus how God had, had set the pattern or how God had instituted there the right form, the accurate form, the requirements of their, of their worship. And today is no different under the law of Christ. It's, our worship is a divine stipulation. We must, as we talked about earlier, must Worship in spirit and in truth. You can see that in Acts 2.42, Ephesians 4, Colossians 3, Colossians, uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, and verse 11. And so I leave you with this question. Are we worshiping God in spirit? Are we worshiping God in truth? Not according to our own wants. Not according to my, my desires or my think-sos. But truly according to what God wants. Both in the church and in my daily life as well. And those five acts of worship that we talked about earlier, are we performing those in a way that God finds to be acceptable? Again, it's about God. It's not about me. It's not about Jerry. It's about Jerry coming in those doors, taking off his coat, putting it on a hanger, and coming in here with the right frame of mind and worshiping God in spirit and in truth. And it's a matter of what I give to God laying it all on the line, singing from the heart, praying from the heart, remembering his son, do this in remembrance of me, of Christ. And to be edified by learning more of God's word, not to be bored, to be a happy people, an enthusiastic people. You know, I can't help but think about, I mentioned this last Thursday, but I can't help think about this. Uh, Brother Mark talked about it a little bit last night, and the church in Laodicea. What kind of people was Jesus talking to there? He was talking to church members. And they had become so apathetic to his word that they made him sick to his stomach. Now this is the Christ that we know to be loving, to have a great disposition of heart, to be one who was a lover of people, who came to seek and to save those individuals that are lost. And here Jesus says, you make me so sick, I want to throw you up. Now, if he said that to them, is he saying that about us today in our worship? Because of the things we involve ourselves in that, we, that sometimes get a little lax and we just let go on because 
that's kind of the normal part of worship? Or is Jesus really sitting back and saying, man, there's a great church. There's a people who are on fire for the Lord. They're doing everything that they can possibly do to win souls to me, to Christ. I pray daily that he looks upon us corporately as a church and individually as members in, in that regard. Because ultimately it's up to me. The Bible says to work out your own fear or your own salvation with fear and trembling. Do I do that? Am I worried about going to heaven or hell? Do I even give it any thought? Someone gave it some thought on a billboard that coming this way, going uh, west on 94. There's a billboard. Maybe you've seen it. Heaven or hell? Where are you going? Heaven or hell? And that's a great question. We need to ask ourselves that on a daily basis. Are you going to heaven, friend? Or are you going to hell? Jesus, the great inviter. I could almost see Jesus. Can't you standing there, arms outstretched, tears flowing down from his eye, from his from his cheeks, a concerned look. Inviting people, hey, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Come, take my yoke upon you, it's free. Come, enjoy the blessings that you can only enjoy through me as the Son of God. Are you a member of the Lord's church this morning? Have you been immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins? Have you been added to the New Testament church? I'm not talking about some church, the New Testament church, the one that we can read about. For example, in Matthew 16 and verse 18, where Peter told Jesus, or Jesus told Peter, I'm going to give you the keys to my kingdom. And in Acts chapter 2, Peter gets up that day and preaches the best sermon ever preached, telling those men and brethren, those keys that Jesus had expounded upon, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Have you done that today? We'll give you an opportunity. I believe there's water in the baptistry. I think all things are ready. The blood of Christ has flowed on Calvary's cross. It continues to flow for you to take advantage of that. Would you do that this morning if you'd wander back into the world? Friend, maybe your worship hasn't been what it needs to be. If it's something that you feel you can go to God in prayer and ask God for strength and encouragement for, then do that. Do that as we sing the invitation song. Ask God for strength. Ask Him for encouragement. So that you truly might be encouraged to worship Him in church, in church, and out of church in a way that would be pleasing before him. If you need any help this morning, come right now. Together we stand and as we sing. Would you be free from your burden of sin? Good power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you be full of victory when there's wonderful power in the blood?